Catherine, if I may, I want to poll the audience for a second, just so we can create a profile of who all these folks are. So let me ask you guys, let me see, get a show of hands. How many of you are undergraduates? Ooh, Ooh OK. okay. Uh, well, at Stanford, that just means you're going to start your company three years earlier, right? You're going to. Uh, how about graduate students? People are out working in the uh, in the real world. Uh, next, how many of you have ever worked in a startup? Okay, that's pretty impressive. How many of you have ever founded a startup? And. Uh, Apropos of today's conversation, how many of you intend at some point in your career to be either an angel investor or a venture capitalist? I'll be calling all of you soon. Uh, <laughs> okay, now we know who we're talking okay. to. Okay. So, how did you get into venture capital? You, you, you say you had a crazy path to Silicon Valley. Give me a little history. Yeah, okay. You guys got to hear this. I mean, the first 10 years of my life was pretty random, and uh, my business life. And I, so if any of you undergrads think you might kind of suck at career planning or don't have a career plan, listen to this. If I can do it, you can do it. So um, where were you born? I was born in LA, um, but went to school at the University of Toronto because I'm retarded about weather. So <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so um, yeah, so I'll just run through this real quick because it's so crazy. Um, so, uh, raised in LA, uh, and st this violin playing thing has been a lifelong thing with me. So, I studied music at USC starting before I was in college. And so, then when I decided to major in physics, like I didn't think to change. So, I went to USC <laughs> um, briefly. And um, Caltech didn't take women back in the late 60s. So, I would love to have gone to Caltech, but that didn't work out. So, um, Anyway, so, but I had a boyfriend at Caltech, so I got to use their computer. So I bootlegged time on their CDC 6600, and I literally learned to program Fortran out of the trash can there. I would pick up listings, study them, and that's how I learned Fortran. Anyway, but then I went to University of Toronto um, and majored in physics at a real science and engineering school, and that was good. And I also wrote a bunch of Fortran programs there for their IBM 360. I was writing curve fitting routines back then. <laughs> and, uh, and anyway, so BS in physics, and then I just, I thought I wanted to go on for a PhD in physics, but I had an opportunity to be an intern at Argonne Lab and, in Chicago. And so I took that and um, got more free programming time on uh, mini computers and wrote a bunch of uh, simulations for quantum mechanical processes and stuff like that. But more importantly, I figured out after a year doing that that I didn't want to be a physicist. So, <laughs> so I went and got an engineering job in Chicago. So I started in engineering at a big company, Chicago Bell & Howell, which is no longer in existence. Um, and then I realized that I didn't know anything about accounting and all that business jazz. So I went off to University of Chicago and got an MBA. Um, then worked at another big company in Chicago. So finally, so like, and I loved computers this whole time, and I was really thinking, what am I doing here? I really, really should be in the computer business. But I'm kind of glad I didn't jump too early, because if I had, I would have ended up in Boston at a mini computer company, and that's not where I wanted to be. So when the microprocessor got invented, that's when I got really anxious and finally came out here. So it was the, it was the 8008 so. that convinced you to move to Silicon Valley? Actually, the truth is, it was more like the Z80, but... Oh, okay. Still Federico. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Really. So, uh, so when personal computers started happening, that's when I said, okay, they can't do this without me. I've got to be out there. So, so I left. And by then, of course, I'd had kind of a big job there. So my CEO at the large company I left was like, you can't leave. You're the highest ranking woman in the company. I was a division marketing manager. So anyway, so it was a little bit hard to leave, but not that hard. So I came out here and joined um, my first startup. Well, I didn't know what I was doing. So I interviewed at Tandem and Apple and Intel. Those were the kind of big companies back then. But I said, heck, you know, I really want to do a startup. So I'm not going to join one of those. So I ended up with this weird logic of joining the smallest company that made me an offer. I decided that's what I was going to do. And so I joined this company called Data Systems Design. I don't know if you know this. And they are all uh, gone. All gone, yeah. And they made PDP-11 peripherals back in the day. This is like 1980. and um, 
one of the cool things is that one of our customers was Larry Ellison, who was writing Oracle in PDP 11 Assembler in a little suite up at Sand Hill Road. And so I went to meet Larry and uh, somewhere along the line, and I was like, oh, I gotta be at Oracle. And here's where chance favors the prepared mind, is one, one of my favorite sayings. Because all those years that I sort of wasted at big companies, I did develop a perspective of what big companies needed. And when I saw this product, I was like, this is going to change the world, the big company data world, and I got to be there. Well, you know, that's so. always been a debate whether you should go work for a big company for a while and get perspective, or go start in a small company and escape all the damage right. that a big company does to you. Yeah, right. Big debate right now. Yeah. And, um, Where do you come down on it? Well, in my day, and, and, and in my career in the 40 years since then, I've always advised young people to go, like, go get a job at Intel or Oracle or Google or some good place that's going to teach you some stuff and then go start a company. Um, I'm not so sure that's the right advice now. Um, the advice I still have now, though, is whatever you do, make sure you're learning from really, really smart people. Um, but the big company thing, I don't know, it's changing so fast. But for me, it was great to have the perspective of what big companies need as far as software and data networking and all the stuff I made all that money in in the venture capital business was in part informed by the, the market, the end user view I had from my eight years at big companies. So your second employer in the Valley was Oracle? Yes, sir. How many people were there? Uh, like 15, but I wasn't employee number 15 because Larry had gone through a few people, so yeah. I was probably more like, I don't know, 25-ish. <laughs> now, did, did you have any sense it was going to be Oracle? Yes, I yeah. did, even though our sales numbers back then were 1 million, 3 million, 5 million, 12 million. So that's not like, that's good, but it's not like off the charts. That was 81, 82, 83, 84. And then after the 12 million, it doubled every year for a long time. Um, and the reason I had a sense it was going to be Oracle was, firstly, because Larry is truly the best entrepreneur I've ever met. The man's amazing. Okay, I was going to ask you about that. Because, <laughs> I mean, he obviously has a very unique reputation. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, one of them is Oracle... And when it was going full bore, was an absolute insane pressure cooker. I mean, the joke always was, the first year you're there, you think you've landed the best job in the world. The second year you're there, you begin to wonder what's wrong with you. And the third year, you're in intensive therapy. So, did, was it like that when you were there? I don't think quite that. Larry was still uh, yeah, getting his style organized. And so I remember a, a side of Larry that... I don't think he lets show very often nowadays, but he loved to laugh. He had a huge sense of humor. We spent, if we weren't yelling at each other, we were laughing. And so uh, it was a very funny but intense time. And there was also some, I mean, the term spitting mad, I actually have seen that. <laughs> and so, but the important thing about Oracle as a business was, with this little dinky thing in this little tiny suite in Sand Hill, and the phone was ringing all the time. People were really interested in what we had, and they were like, we couldn't wait to get the product. And of course, you know, there was a lot of bugs to fix, and it was like not an easy product to build, so. What did you learn about working for a company growing that fast? I mean, there's really not much that gets taught about being in a, in a Comet-like startup, where it's doubling in size every six months or three months. Right, or... and none of us had ever done it before either, so there was nobody to go ask. Yeah. <laughs> well, there was a, a, there was Don Lucas upstairs from us who actually invested like 50k or something. I don't know, and uh, so so he was kind of some gray hair around there, but uh, it was just breathless. And all that mattered to Larry, rightly so, I think back then, was engineering and sales. Like marketing, what I did didn't matter, which is why I had a sales quota. <laughs> so I did the OEM sales, and that was fine. And, and, and that, that's why I really learned to sell. Very important. So all you engineers out there, if you're going to do startups, make sure you learn how to sell. Really important. And I, and I know my son's an engineer, so I know that engineers are like, what? I don't want to sell. I don't like salesmen. Get over that. <laughs> now, there's another aspect of Larry's reputation that I want to bring up. You and I had lunch one day with Pat House, who was just a counterpart of yours at Oracle. And I asked both of you, and she went on, of course, to be CEO of Siebel Systems and, and all that. And I said, I don't understand how two strong women like the two of you could work at a place for Larry Ellison. And you guys took great umbrage at that. You almost yelled at me over the <laughs> table. Why? I mean, he's, he does have a certain I can't. I still can't remember what I said there. But 
You said because he's a damn good, uh, he's the world's greatest expert on database management. Yeah, and a, and a great entrepreneur. Larry's an amazing guy, and he is, he is agnostic, as far as I can tell, about women. I mean, he, uh, look at Saffir Katz nowadays. Yeah. And um, uh, so he doesn't care who you are or what you are as long as you're great at what you do. And so, you know, I'm a defender of Larry. On, so on how long were you at Oracle? I was only there for th three years. And that was so, your last real job. It, it was. <laughs> that was the last time you ever worked for anybody. It, it was. Now, yeah. did you have like some epiphany, you know, <laughs> that you're walking along this, uh, alongside the bay underneath, the, you know, the Emerald Towers, and uh, <laughs> you just said, I don't want to work for anybody anymore? Uh, sort of. But my epiphany was that I got fired. Oh, well, that'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> Larry used to express extreme displeasure by firing people. And... Um, he would, I think I'd probably been fired a couple of times before, but it was just bullshit and I didn't pay attention to it. But, yeah. but this time, he really fired me. And like, I, I didn't get hired back until after lunch. <laughs> and, uh, and so oh, he really meant it. And I, I thought, shit, that sucks. I'm, I'm not doing that anymore. So I think the term nowadays is you incorporated. I decided, oh shit, sorry. Um, I wasn't gonna do that anymore. And so I quit. I, well, I stayed there for a few more months, but I was just grumpy and I quit. And that's what happened. And then, but then I was like, geez, I don't want to work for a, a startup that, that, you know, that's not as good as Oracle. And believe me, there wasn't another company as good as Oracle at the time. So I was like, ooh, I got to think something up. And so. Let me ask you yeah. one quick question, because I don't think this ever gets addressed either. What do you do on the morning after? You quit a place like Oracle, where you have no job prospects yet. You don't know exactly what you're going well, to do. Well, it wasn't that bad. Well, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> I had lots of job prospects. People were calling me about startups that sucked. I mean, by then, okay. there, this was 1984. So there was some venture capital. There was a few companies starting. So it wasn't that bad. Well, other bad. than Apple, though, it was kind of an ugly startup era. I, you know, and like Bill Cross at 3Com was talking to me about being marketing VP at 3Com. That would have been legit, right? Mm -hmm. But I, I, didn't, I didn't want to do that. So. Um, anyway, so I, I got kind of, so this is another like crazy career move. I thought, well heck, I'll just be an executive recruiter. Because I was getting called by all these recruiters and I'm thinking they're having more fun than I'm having. So, um, so I started an executive search firm, which um, seems really crazy. But my plan was that it was going to be a temporary thing. It'd be a, like a cool way to look for an, another startup. And I thought I'd maybe do it for a year. but. Um, it turned out I did it for five years, uh, and I really loved it, although five years was enough. Um, so I started recruiting people like me, other marketing VPs, but then I branched into sales VPs and engineering VPs, and then pretty soon I started getting called to do searches for CEOs for venture capital firms, and so I did all that stuff. For and had a baby. Time. True. For you ladies. I, I, um, it was on my mind when I did this was also, oh, I could have that baby, which is like getting kind of late in the day for me. So um, I did that. And, and I, to this day, don't know how you can have a baby and do a real startup. Uh, no clue. So I couldn't. So I did it that way. And it was great. So I got, got my baby, who's now 27 years old. Yeah. But, uh, and doing what? And, and he's a mechanical engineer, having a great time. <laughs> um, anyway, so... Yeah, so the recruiting thing turned out to be a really interesting career move. I'm not recommending it, but I'm just saying, do interesting stuff, you know? So how'd you become a VC? Yeah, so you know, most people that want to be a VC find it really hard to get into the business, but... Um, most people, even very successful people, go in and fail. We've seen a lot of well-known Silicon Valley figures over the last true. 30 years become VCs and it just doesn't work for them. Why did it work for you? Yeah, good question. Um, well, I think part of it was actually, over the five years that I was a recruiter, I literally worked with 80 different companies. And, um, and I was a retained recruiter, so I had to like, I'd like strap my body to these companies. And if it, if it sucked and didn't work, I couldn't like get somebody to join them. So I had learned to be very careful about who I took on as a client which meant I had to understand the market. They had to have a market opportunity that made sense where I could recruit a superstar to join them. And so I learned a lot about what kind of market opportunity makes sense. I, I watched these companies in various stages of success or disarray. And like, you know, anytime you're recruiting a CEO, there's probably something going on. So um, I learned a fair amount about, 
uh, what can go right, what can go wrong. And, I, and, so, and, and in five years, I saw 80 companies. A venture capitalist doesn't get to do that. A VC might invest in, I don't know, two, three, four companies a year. So it takes a lot of years before they can see all that stuff up close. So you weren't just so, filling job slots. You were actually studying business plans and doing due diligence. I kind of was, because yeah. I didn't take, I had more business coming at me than I could handle. So I would like try to figure out which was the best one. And uh, what, I only worked on three searches at a time. And so, yeah, so I, I had, so part of the reason I was successful was that um, I had all that perspective. And I guess, I don't know what. You think you have an aptitude for it? Uh, maybe. Yeah? <laughs> what in your personality makes you a good VC? Uh, good question. I really like digging into people. And I got pretty good at it. And so I, I like to understand what makes people tick and, and what makes them motivated. And so there's that, that whole side of it. The other side of it is like, Physics is a dangerous major because you know a little bit about everything, and nobody's too sure what you don't know. And so, <laughs> and so, I was able to always like figure out if the technology made some kind of sense, if it was like doable by human beings, and all that kind of stuff. And also, I think really good venture capital is a craftsmanship job. And yeah. I'm I'm a musician and a painter, and that's that I'm kind of craftsmanship matters to me. Well, we get to the other. Great question then. The debate has always been, do you invest in the team? Are you a John Doerr school of investing in the team or you, do you invest in the product? Uh -huh. I, I am hardcore market opportunity investor. So even though I love people and I had a lot of that you know, experience with the recruiting stuff, um, if, if, if you have a great market opportunity, you can get great people. And if you have a sucky market opportunity, you can't. And so, uh, I, and so the, the popular term is pivot these days. I think that's way easier said than done. Um, so thinking, oh, well, if this doesn't work, I can pivot, I, I think is a little bit wacky. And so um, definitely a market opportunity investor. And so of all the companies I did uh, in my venture capital career, um, I only broke that rule a couple of times. And I should say, I only had two failures. We'll come back to that. But one of them, <laughs> interestingly enough, with Steve Blank and Rocket Science Games. Those of you who know Steve know this story. And I know Steve's in London right now, so I can say this. So, so Steve used to um, ask me, he was going like, so, so we're fucking up, aren't you gonna fire me? And I'm like, Steve, believe me, I would if I thought it would make any difference, but this market sucks and there ain't nothing we can do about it. And so, you know. And you're still friends with him all these years very, later. Oh, God, we've known each other for 35 years. We were counting it up the other day. So anyway. Well, that's kind um, of unusual. That says something about you as well. And about Steve. Yeah, well, a lot about it's Steve. It's like we're both it's still like, alive. Yeah, he didn't hold any but... grudges. <laughs> 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 oh, no. No, it was a learning experience for both of us. But, but anyway, tell yeah, me, I'm a market up. Tell me about some of those early person. companies you invested in. And if you have any anecdotes about them. It, yeah. Um, oh, I could talk for hours about these. We probably don't want to get too carried away. But like, uh, the list is. Uh, uh, you may not know all these companies, but um, Documentum, which I invested in the early 90s, which is to this day a very much a living product, yeah. although went public and then got acquired. Um, Interwoven, um, uh, Grand Junction Networks, um, Applied Digital Access, Primary Access to um, telecom companies. So I did a lot of telecom networking and enterprise software. That was the kind of stuff yeah. that was good in my era. And, but your ratio was astounding. And, and I think you attribute yeah. it to the fact that you never accepted that standard VC ratio of two winners out of 10 and yeah. Four, oh, yeah. four struggle along and It know, really the rest irritates die. me when VCs say, oh yeah, you know, well there's gonna be one, out of 10 deals, there's gonna be one winner, you know, two or three also rants and the rest are write-offs. I never played that game, never even thought about it. My idea was that everyone had to be a winner. And, um, and so, I, and that, this market opportunity thing, I only went into it if I was convinced that it was going to be a winner. I didn't get it right all the time, but, uh, and if a company was starting to fail, I worked my butt off to not let that happen. Even if I ended up with like two or three times my money, there's a pride thing for me and a, and a life thing for the entrepreneurs whose life was on the line for a few years there. And so I just, I yeah, didn't I'm sure take a lot failure. of investors don't think about the lives of the people they're investing in. Well, yeah, it's, I don't take failure kindly. So I could tell one war story if we're not. Yeah, a near-death experience. <laughs> yeah, 
a bunch of my companies that turned out very successful had near-death experiences. Like, so if you start it, people get ready for this. It's like not so easy. So um, I'll just tell a Grand Junction Network story. So this company made the first ether, 100 megabit ethernet switch back in the early 90s. Um, and they were a bunch of guys from 3Com, incredibly talented guys. And, um, and for me, the scariest part of any startup is, OK, you're done with the engineering and you put the product out on the market, and they don't beat a path to your door. It's like nobody does anything, and it's horrible, which is why Steve Blank does his thing. But we'll come back to that. Anyway, so, so we introduced our product. Nobody bought it. And these guys were 3Com guys, so they were used to indirect distribution channels. So they signed up a bunch of distributors and dealers and stuff like that. Well, they, those kind of channels can't deal with a completely new technology. This has to be sold direct. And I couldn't convince them of that because they were three com guys. And so I said, OK, uh, here's the deal. We'll do it your way. I can't remember whether it was, I said, for six months or until we only have 500K in cash left. But I said, I, I set an end point because I knew it wasn't going to work. But I knew this product was going to work in the market. So, so they kind of ran out of time. Nobody had bought hardly anything. And, but in the background, I was recruiting a, a, a direct sales force, a bunch of um, uh, sales reps. There were some good ones available at the time. So when the, they hit my day, I said, OK, here we go. I've got these five guys. We're going to go sell direct now. And they go, well, OK, but we don't think it'll work. And then it just completely took off. And it like quadrupled in sales every month. And then it got to be like doubling in sales every month until the numbers got huge. And, um, and, and then we had an interesting debate whether to go public or sell to Cisco for a Pretty nice price. And that, um, by the way, Grand Junction Networks, as well as Documentum, are both Stanford Business School cases. I don't know if you guys still study that stuff. but um, So it was the sell to Cisco versus go public that's the case. But the more interesting case to me is the what happened in the distribution channels. Anyway, so that company is now worth billions of dollars. And the seed of the whole um, uh, Ethernet switching business at Cisco came from these guys. And I just saw them. We just had a 20-year reunion <laughs> and got together out in Colorado and reminisced about all this jazz. And six out of the seven people around the table were pilots, which that was pretty cool. But Plus whatever. you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, you were a pioneer of micro venture capital firms. You, uh, according to the records, uh, Floodgate, Pejman, Marr, Engineering Capital. Want to yeah. tell me about them? Yeah, are, sure. are they Are they alike? Are they different? They're... Mm, Pretty different. So um, yeah, so I helped Mike Maple start um, Floodgate back in. We, we dreamed it up in 07, but I think we raised the money in 08. And, um, and at the time, the whole idea of the craftsmanship in early stage, it was partly the economics that it was now possible to start a company with a, a lot less money than before. So you didn't need to go raise 10 million bucks right out of the chute. But the other side of it was, um, there's a, a good deal of craftsmanship involved in this, and Mike has that skill set. And so, um, so we started found, uh, Floodgate in uh, 08, and he's on his, I think, his fifth fund now. And I'm an investor in all his funds, and I still coach those guys pretty often. And then Pedgman Marr, um, I worked with those uh, guys to get started um, and help them bring in some investors, and, and I coach them now and then. And then uh, Engineering Capital, uh, we just closed today. Um, and Ashmeet Sanan is the founder, and they do. Uh, Ashmeet's going to do enterprise infrastructure software. So, whereas Pedro Mar does, and Floodgate both do a, a fair amount of consumer stuff as well as enterprise. So, kind of a mix. And uh, interestingly enough, both Floodgate and um, Pedro Mar have. There she is. A woman. Um, each of them has a woman. Uh, a partner who is also a PhD in some hard stuff at Stanford, which is just amazing. So anyway. Now, was there a moment when I think in everybody's career, if they're pursuing a particular direction, there's a moment when they realize they're, they're good at this, that this is what you were destined to do? Did you have that moment? Yeah, I think kind of by like, I had been in the business maybe three or four years when I started, and my companies were just cooking. Um, yeah, I was starting to think, this is going to work out. And, uh, but I knew that like uh, a couple of years before the outside world knew that. Um, 
but then it, it all happened. Because you, I mean, once you get the market opportunity right and the execution is right, you can't hardly stop it. So. Okay, you've said it's not the calls you take, it's the calls you make in life too. Is that your life motto? <sighs> Well, it certainly what does it was, mean, first of all? <laughs> it certainly wasn't a venture business. This is my little saying that I love. Um, I don't know if people even make calls anymore. Don't you guys like tweet and stuff like that? But anyway, and what it means is this. When you're out in, in the real world, there is, both in startups and venture capital, but for sure venture capital, so much stuff is coming at you. You're just like overwhelmed. You can stay very insanely busy just responding to the stuff that comes to you. And what that saying means is, to me is don't do that. Make sure that you keep in your mind uh, your agenda, your goals, what matters to you, and what kind of moves the state of the art forward. And make sure that every week you at least work a little bit on those things that matter to you, and rather than just like deal with all the shit that's coming your way, which is always a lot. And I think in the venture capital context. Um, if you look at most of my really great startups, they weren't guys that called me. I called them. I found them. And that's pretty huge. Yeah, I mean, you talk about the importance of cold calls, but cold calling is like antithetical to the engineering personality, I think. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, there's always been this dimension of, in what you talk about of having to do the ugly business side of things. It's not just designing products. It's not just chasing a market. It's actually doing the blocking and tackling of real business all the way through. Right. Yeah, designing product is really fun, and there's hardly anything we can't build in Silicon Valley these days. But like, I don't, here again, I don't know if you guys do cold calls, but I used to love it. Because like, you get through the secretary, and then you get to talk to the guy. It's usually a guy. And you got like 12 seconds to grab his attention. I, I found the adrenaline of that really interesting. And so, and I sort of, I of course learned that in the recruiting business, but it turns out to be really useful in life too, you know, like when you're selling stuff. So, um, yeah, and I don't know, I, I went through a phase in my early 20s where I was a physicist and I couldn't be bothered with all that other stuff, but you know what? Nothing happens if you don't make it happen. So let's talk about the venture capital industry now, because you're still deeply, deeply involved. In fact, you're down in town more often now than you were 10 years ago. It seems like. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. how's it changed? Man, well, everything changes in the valley all the time. So, um, you know, at first there was this thing in the early 2000s where um, the, the normal venture firm economics kind of didn't make so much sense because you could start a lot of really great companies on not very much money. And the angel investors were doing a lot of that, and then the, that, which is why the micro VC started. Um, and so, so there's this whole bifurcation now of the venture business between micro VCs and and the larger firms. But then there's also there are like the super VCs, like Andreessen Horowitz, huge firms that do a lot of late stage investing, and we'll come back to that. And some of the um, kind of middle sized firms that were pretty much the model of, of venture capital in my day. Um, uh, but I think w right now the bifurcation is micro VCs and and huge firms. Um, yeah, they talk about they talk about the chasm between uh, angel and Series A. That for all the money you read about in these gigantic funds, there's hundreds of companies sit out, sitting out there right at the edge. They're running out of money from angels, and they can't make that jump to Series A because it's just hard to do, and harder than ever. Well, there's a lot of money out there. It, you, do, you have to have a market opportunity that makes sense. Um, and uh, uh, so I think if you can't raise money in this environment, you probably have to ask yourself, is your, is your market really all that interesting? Yeah. Uh, you also have pointed out that IPOs seem to take a lot longer than they used yeah. to. Man, in my day, in like the 90s, and kind of culminating with 2000, <laughs> yeah. um, you could get a company, uh, my average was kind of between four and seven years of life would, would be when you could expect an IPO or a liquidity event. And uh, that just doesn't happen now. Companies have to be much larger and um, you know, uh, much more sustainable. And I actually think that's really healthy because you know, uh, I lived through <laughs> the 2000 crash. And um, in a way, you know, um, individual investors got hurt in that market. At least now, there's a crash now. It's professional investors that are going to get hurt. I think that's better. Yeah. But um, uh, but the, what's um, working for the super VCs right now is that 
uh, companies are, are required to have much more revenue and much more reality to them before they go public. So all of the money that used to be raised in the public market is in fact being invested by by the later stage venture capitalists. And I actually think that's a very healthy system. Well, we but, saw IPOs disappear, basically, in the, by years. the end of the first decade of this century. And now they're coming back. But M&A is still awfully strong around here. I mean, I can remember 2000, every business plan had an IPO as a liquidation event. By 2006 or seven, it was, the last line was, and then we'll sell to Google. <laughs> and then in 2012, it's then we'll sell to Facebook. Yeah. Uh, how is that ratio swinging these days? Well, true. I think the bar to go public is very high now. Um, but I think, you know, in my venture capital career, I, I made more money selling companies than taking them public. I, I think it's a great route um, for liquidity and a great route for the people. And let me tell you, it sucks being on the board of a public company. So there's that. Um, so I think that's very healthy. I would, for you entrepreneurs, though, I, I think the trick is to keep enough to, to, until you know a little more about what the outcome is going to be, keep your runway clear so that you don't raise too, so much money that you can't sell at a modest price and be happy. Um, you know, so it's, a, it's, it's tempting to go raise too much money, and then you get yourself in a spot where you know, nobody's happy if you don't sell for five hundred million dollars, and those kind of deals are rare. So, whereas if you can sell for like eighty, that could be really nice if you only raised a million bucks. So, um, you got to think about that. And we've been talking about all the changes in venture capital. What stayed the same? I mean, you you have a long history now. You can look yeah. at different generations of venture capitalists. Yeah. Well, um, what stayed the same for startup people is it's still about the market opportunity. Um, uh, when you raise venture capital, it's really important to get a great venture capitalist on your board. Somebody who will like kind of live and die the way I did about whether you succeed or not. Who not just view you as a transaction, but a part of their life that they're going to make successful. Get that. It's really important for you. And there are guys out there that can do that, and, and women. Um, uh, and so I, I would say be very particular about who your investors are. and. Um, and it's not always about price. I would any day recommend taking a great uh, venture capitalist at a lower price than some person at a ridiculously high price. So get, you know, get your um, company funding set. And then later, when things are going well, you can go raise money at crazy prices and get crazy people involved. That's OK. But not until you've built your foundation. You've got a few minutes. Let's dwell down into the process of being a venture capitalist. For example, you talked about the primacy of market opportunity. What does that mean? What do you look for in a, in a great market opportunity? Yeah, so here, here's what I always say. I say I'm looking for um, a target customer with a compelling reason to buy. Now, that seems like a simple thing to say, but there, it's fraught. Like target customer, I should back up one second. I did only B2B. I didn't do consumer. We can come back to that. Um, but target customer means a targetable customer. Like you have to figure out kind of who they are, where they are, how are you going to reach them. They, you have to have a way to reach them. They have to have certain characteristics. And, um, and if you can kind of figure all that out, that will tell you what your kind of sales and marketing strategy needs to be. This is a little bit like what Steve Blank teaches. Um, and the compelling reason to buy is, uh, the product needs to be so good, or so compelling to them anyway, that um, that they'll kind of do anything to get it, like deal with a lot of bugs, stuff that doesn't work right, um, pay you some advance money to continue the development. I've had lots of crazy stories like that. But they have to be really compelled. And compelling usually means a revenue enhancer, not just a cost reduction. Co cost reductions are fine, but something that gets them more revenue faster is uh, Really compelling. And um, now what if there's yeah. a company already in that market, an incumbent company? Yeah, is this it, is something that else. keep you out? Yeah, this is something I learned over all these years in the venture business. We, we all would always worry about the incumbent, whoever had like a similar product in the market all, uh, um, that was a large company. Man, it's very rare that a startup gets beat by a large company. Um, m mostly they get beat by some other startup down the street who's smarter than they are. So I, I would spend time looking at my competitors, uh, my startup competitors, not the big companies. They just 
they don't have the attitude we do. Now, looking out over your career, it seems to me you favor B2B over consumer. Why is that? Yeah. Um, so this target com customer compelling reason to buy thing is um, it's a rational process. And um, so, so you can like go do homework. You can do Steve Blank's lean startup thing and go talk to a, a bunch of target customers. And it, it's fairly logical. Whereas consumer, to me, has, there's always been like an element of luck in, in it. And it's like it's great fun when it works, but you know, it doesn't work all the time. And so, um, and I, I want to do the kind of numbers I did in the venture business, not some random stuff. And um, so consumer doesn't work with kind of my way of thinking. I think consumer stuff is very cool, but uh, I, I, I don't have the guts for it. And so, so when I, sometimes when I come to Stanford, I hear people talking about all these consumer ideas, and you know, it, it, it looks easy, but it's not. So you have to also ask yourself if you're a lucky person, I think. I, you know, um, I, don't, I don't think it's for everybody. So I would encourage you, if you're not so sure you're a lucky person, maybe think about some B2B stuff. <laughs> Let's talk about the CEO now. How do you how do you find a good CEO? What do you look for? You know, it's it boils down to pretty simple stuff, but hard to find. Um, I look for a CEO who's a a great leader. There's one of them sitting in the back <laughs> right now, um, and um, and also who's the best salesman in the company. Uh, that like if they if you get that CEO in front of a customer, they're going to buy the stuff, and. And that doesn't mean that the CEO had to come up through sales. I've had great salesmen who were engineers or marketing people. And, and so uh, it doesn't kind of matter where they came from, but they have to be a great salesman. And not just to the customers, but also to recruit people into the company, to get venture capitalists to invest. It's really crucial. Um, You've and, also talked about keeping them aligned. They have to, a great CEO has to keep everybody going in the same that's, direction. Yeah, that's the leadership thing. Because these yeah. startups that fail often have, like, everybody's mad at each other, and they're all going off doing it in different directions, and it's all crazy. It's really important that the whole team is pushing in the same direction, kind of has the same vision, um, kind of knows what the plan is, knows who the competitors are. And, and that comes from leadership. And, I've also noticed a lot of really good CEOs actually know when to stop people. That, that startups have a tendency to just keep designing stuff. They keep having really great ideas, and if the CEO doesn't say, okay, we're gonna do this one, they never do. They just go on forever. Yeah, then that's, that's also the job of a, of a good venture capitalist, too. I mean, yeah. it's like, yeah. <laughs> um, not to bring up Larry Ellison again, but you said he, you said he was an interesting leader because he had periods of enormous, almost superhuman intensity, and then periods of abdication. Yeah, what we, does that mean? We weren't sure what it meant. <laughs> we used to talk about that. Um, Larry used to, would do his thing, but then every, I don't know, couple of months, he'd disappear for three or four days, maybe a week. And we didn't know where he was. A few people would get emails from him. But I think he was, he was thinking stuff up. So Larry was that rare case of a guy who had, was pretty incredible on execution but also kind of had the, the technology strategy in his head and the, the business strategy. And so he used to like go away and think, I think. And uh, we were never too sure what he was doing. But, but he, I know he would come back from these things with all these ideas. The, well, the thing you were talking about. Yeah. He would have like 50 ideas. And then we'd all go dump on all those ideas. And we'd hone him down. But you, often, uh, he would come back. There was a nugget in there. And so I think that's what he was doing. That, an interesting case, and I don't think that's sort of normal for a CEO, but it worked for Larry. Let's talk about life and being a CEO. I'll give you an anecdote of my own. I was interviewing Scott McNeely from my PBS series, and we got talking, and I asked a question. I said, you've got little kids at home. How do you balance having a family with running a Fortune 100 company? God, what did he say? He got this terrified look in his eyes, <laughs> and he said, I can't. I just can't. And the PR person ran onto the set, grabbed him, and said, Mr. McNeely has to go, and took him <laughs> off <laughs> and ended the, ended the recording. Uh, because, well, because you can't allow the CEO of a company that size to show human weakness, right? Not in the public eye. Yeah. So you have said, if you're trying to find a, a work-life balance as a startup CEO, forget it. Oh, yeah, I'd, I'd say that's right. Um, 
Yeah, people talk about this balance thing, but like I never figured it out. I literally had to start my recruiting firm to have a baby. I couldn't figure it out. Um, venture capital is way easier than a startup, so like I could sort of do that. But um, you can't do it, I don't think. And do a great job. You can do a so-so job, but a so-so job in a startup will get you killed. So um, I think, uh, like I quit vi playing violin for five years <laughs> while I was doing startups. That's how bad it was for me. Um, so I think uh, you've got to be ready to really put everything into it. And like, um, and one of my, uh, which reminds me of an anecdote, because Martin Bronze is sitting in the back. So one, one night, I, I used to do my best worrying at night because I didn't have time during the day. And so I was, <laughs> I was sitting there thinking, well, trying to sleep, thinking about some, I can't, it was some dumb pricing issue or something at Interwoven. And I, and I had it all figured out. So I, I call up uh, Martin's voicemail. This is back in the day, a voicemail. Thought I would leave him this big, long dump because it was like too long to type. So I call him up. It's like 3.30 in the morning. He answers the freaking phone. And I'm going, what are you doing? And he goes, well, I'm working. What are you doing? I'm like, we got to talk. <laughs> and you know, that's the kind of life that, you, you've, that well, venture capitalists maybe don't always have to live like that, but CEOs do. So don't think too much about balance. What advice do you have for someone st starting a company today? And I'll give, you a, I'll give you the first one, which is you've said, listen to Steve Blank. Yeah. Well, I, I presume a bunch of you guys have heard Steve Blank's stuff. But uh, the whole Anybody thing. know who we're talking about? Hands? You guys all know Steve Blank, right? Good. Yeah, okay. see, he's, yeah he does a great job. So, um, so this thing I was saying about uh, the, back in, in the old days, the, the day you got your product all done, and you put it out there on the market, it's the most scary day for me because nobody buys it. And then you have to go actually figure out what the hell you're doing. So what Steve has invented is a methodology for um, kind of figuring, getting to that spot way earlier before you've spent all the money and built maybe the wrong product. Um, and so take his lean startup thing seriously. Um, figure out what your market is and how it works and who are the target customers and all that stuff, much of which can be done without a complete product. So that's that's really important. I would say the next thing is to surround yourself with incredible people. Um, and be that people in your company, uh, as we talked earlier about your, your venture capital investors. And I'd encourage all you guys that are starting companies, not just to get venture capital, great venture capitalists and great employees, um, but also to get somebody else on your board than an investor, some outside person who has wonderful industry experience and who might like to share that. Um, I encourage all my companies to have an independent um, director, and that's just been invaluable. So there's a couple of things. How about money? Oh, ah, yeah, money. Well, um, yeah, we, we've talked about um, raising money from, from the best venture capitalists you can in the early days, and don't worry about getting the best price until later. And this whole thing of keeping your runway clear until you're uh, sure that you're not going to have to sell for 80 million bucks. You, you don't want to raise too much money. You've said that finding customers is the hardest thing to do right now. And I've seen an awful lot of really good startups on paper. They even have a good prototype of their product, but they can't break through all that noise out there. There is so much noise, uh, especially in the consumer sphere uh, of branding and marketing out there, that it seems almost impossible to get enough customers. That's why I don't do consumer deals. Yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> Reed, I, I, I saw Reed Hoffman a couple months ago, and he said, you know, to be frank, if we were trying to start LinkedIn right now, we would fail. Because we did it when there wasn't a lot of noise out there. Well, and yeah, said, but Mar Hershenson's right here in the audience, and she has a bunch of consumer deals that are doing incredible. And So how do you rise above the noise? I don't know. <laughs> have Mark come up here yeah. and talk. Um, I, I do think, I mean, of course you have to have great stuff, but that's not, an, you know, I think there's an element of luck, an element of style. Um, I, I think it's risky business. How do you get the right, you talked about you want to get people with experience uh, on your board. How do you get them? I mean, if you go to a venture capital firm these days, a lot of them are so bloated with, you know, people that are younger than you. <laughs> You know, I mean, That's people, people that are just out of college and they're, they're, getting, they're, they're getting enormous responsibility. And there's always that former CEO sitting there somewhere in that firm. How do you get his or her attention? 
How do you get that expertise, that wisdom? Yeah, well, I don't think you get it from a venture capital firm. I mean, occasionally you, you do. You can find a venture capitalist who had a great operating experience, but even still, you want to counterbalance that. So, so I think you, uh, as a founder of a company, you sort of make a list of the 20 guys you admire most in the business and cold call them or cold text whatever. them or whatever. Um, Go, go make it happen. Pick, pick them out. And you know, you'd be surprised. You find somebody who's, I don't know, in their late 30s, has had a successful startup, maybe they're still working at it. You'd be surprised how interesting it is for people like that to sit on a board, particularly if they're not on a board. So they don't, they don't have to be like professional board sitters. Um, and it's great advice for you, and it's great kind of counterbalance to the venture capitalists because they're not always right. So it's nice to have a guy who's like independent and good. Before we run out of time, when you look back on your career, what are you proudest of? Well, in the, in the venture capital side of it, I'm, I'm really proud that I did right by my investors. My investors were all university endowments, foundations, and a few pension funds. And so that, uh, you know, 90% IRR, actually our funds, the, 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 all the funds I've been active in were returned six to eight times. So huge IRRs for those. So I'm really proud of, of that for the investors. And, uh, and I got to have the fun of creating some great companies with some amazing people. And, and of course now in my dotage, <laughs> a bunch of those CEOs are like my personal friends. And that's just really, that's a gift. Now it seems to me that you've found a balance if I had asked you 15 years ago, if someone said, how's Catherine? Does she have a good life balance? I would say, I don't know. She's always in the office. But now I visualize you at the ranch, you know, walking among the grapevines, <laughs> checking out the crush. Oh, yeah. You know, and, and more than that, you became a philanthropist. I mean, at one point, weren't you the, the world's leading supporter of original classic music? I was, of composers. Of composers. Yeah, I, I did that for a while. And... Uh, yeah, but I mean, I'm retired now. I'm, I'm, I have great... Yeah, how many days are you in, in the Valley per week? Uh, uh, seriously, I'm here like every other week, maybe. Okay. You know, How many, I, how no. many companies are you uh, watching right now? No, no, zero. Zero? But I'm working with the three uh, micro VCs, okay. and so I visit them. And Is that when you, you know. find the balance? You find it after your career? I think so, <laughs> as far as I know. <laughs> yeah, so I, you know, I, I have a good life on all that right now. What advice do you give to the, uh, the young women in this audience? Okay. I really, so, want you to, uh, I really want you to address that. You've mentioned the term, the, you've said it's valuable to be oblivious. <laughs> yeah. I really want to know what that yeah. means. Okay, so, so for you women, um, we kind of skipped over the, the fact that I was at Merrill Pickard, an old line venture firm, and then in the mid 90s started um, Foundation Capital. And the reason I started Foundation Capital was that I couldn't get a job. So. Um, and by then, my track record, I was already well on the way to this 90% IRR. I had a bunch of great companies. Um, so, uh, but my, Merrill Pickard blew up. And um, Andy Reckliff, whom some of you may know, and Bruce Dunleavy went off to form, uh, with some other guys, Benchmark Capital. And I went off eventually to form um, Foundation Capital. But before I did that, I, I thought, eh, maybe I'll just go like join an existing firm. But I was kind of picky. There was only... I, a large handful of firms that I would have joined. And I went and started talking to those guys, mind you, with this track record. And it was like, I, I spent maybe three months doing that. And it was clear that it was going to take like a really long time. And so this is the only time in my career that, that I feel like I, I reached a wall because I was a woman. Because if I had been a guy, I am sure that I would have been snapped up really quickly. Um, and so I was like, shit. I'm not going to spend a year doing this because you know I was right in the middle of this. I had all these companies and I was on all these boards, all these companies going public left and right, and I had you know lots of good things happening, and I didn't want to spend a year kind of looking for a job. So I, I decided, well, hell, I'll just um, start a firm. So so I started my firm and hooked up with a, a couple other people who were loose in the business, and we started the firm, and. Um, and so I had the money raised, you know, in a, in a few months. And, and now, as it turns out, that, it's kind of a sour grape sounding thing, but I loved it. I was so glad that I got to start my own firm and do things my way, and <coughs> it was great. And um, almost all of our investors, our original investors, were investors uh, in my previous firm, so they knew me. 
And so that part wasn't hard. In fact, of, uh, endowments and foundations, those kind of entities, a goodly number of the chief investment officers of those companies are uh, women. So raising money was no problem. But there was this weird thing about venture capital. Um, and all male firms. And if you look around the valley even now, there are very few high level women that have gone into those all male firms. I think like Mary Meeker at, has done it at Kleiner, but she's amazing. And there aren't, I can't, I have a hard time thinking of too many more. Um, so what is oblivious? Oh, oblivious, oh yeah. So, <laughs> so I was sitting with Steve Blake a couple weeks ago going, Steve, I've had, like this whole woman thing is like maybe blown out of proportion because I've had absolutely no problems in my life. It's just been great, except for that one you know, exception. Um, and he says, no, nah, Catherine, the problem with you is you're oblivious. I'm like, oh. <laughs> and uh, I would say being oblivious is a great strategy for women. Just forget about it. Just plow right through those walls and don't think about it. Because if you sit there and dwell on, oh, God, you know, is he not listening to me because I'm a woman? or because I suck. Better to assume that it's because you suck and you've got to clean it up than to assume that you're a woman because that's just kind of a loser attitude anyway. So uh, be oblivious. It's a good plan. <laughs> Work for me. <laughs> what if you discover you suck and you need to clean it up? What do you got to do? Uh, you talk about introspection. But you talked about demeanor and, and manner. Oh, and yeah. It, yeah, it is important to have I mean, I think most of you women here get this. You have to have like the right demeanor. You don't want to be having guys flirting with you um, and stuff. But I really believe that if you carry yourself in the right way, that's not going to happen. I just I, I can't even imagine. What that. about the what about the deadly G word, gravitas? Yeah, uh, right. I think it's important to develop that and. You probably get that from developing your sales skills. I don't know, <laughs> but um, calls. there's maybe there. I don't know. Maybe there should be some lessons on that because I actually think that's important for women because people do scrutinize you more than they scrutinize a man, and they're looking for the negative ones. Are looking for cr sort of cracks in your demeanor, and um, or signs of weakness, or signs of feminine things, or you know, afraid they might make you cry or some shit like that. So. You know, you, you, you should, there should maybe some, be some demeanor lessons, I don't know. Ladies Before, and gentlemen, the, I want to thank you. the singular Catherine Goals. I'm sorry. <laughs>